Good afternoon. My name is Sudhir Hazari Singh, and um, with my colleague Dan Butt, uh, uh, we're politics fellows uh, at the college. And on behalf of Balliol, uh, it's our pleasure to welcome you all, um, current and former members of Balliol, members of the university, and visitors to this year's Omar Azfar lecture. This uh, annual lecture series was established in 2015 to honor the memory of Omar Azfar, who came to Balliol in 1987 to read PPE. In fact, he was uh, uh, in one of the first cohorts of students that I taught. Um, uh, Omar became an economist and specialized in the fields of crime and corruption, and he was strongly committed to the ideal of social justice and sadly he passed away in 2009. And the lecture series um, are funded thanks to uh, generous benefactions from our members, family and friends, uh, including Omar's parents, uh, Kamal Asfar and Nahid Asfar, and close college friends of Omar, uh, most notably Jeremy Burkhardt, who I know is with us um, this afternoon. Um, hello, Jeremy. Um, for this year's lecture, we're delighted to welcome uh, Adam Getachew, who's Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. Adam is a political theorist with research interests in the history of political thought, uh, theories of race and empire, and also um, post-colonial political theory. Her work focuses on the intellectual and political histories of Africa and the Caribbean, and her first book, uh, which was called uh, World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination, was published by Princeton University Press in 2019. It reconstructed the idea of self-determination in the political thought of Black Atlantic anti-colonial nationalists in the 20th century. The book, uh, which is wonderful, won the Best Theory Book Award of the International Studies Association in 2019 and the W.E.B. Du Bois Distinguished Book Award of the National Council of Black Political Scientists in 2020. Uh, on a personal note, uh, if you'll allow me, I'd also like to pay tribute to Adam's absolutely brilliant article um, on the political thought of the Haitian Revolution, which appeared in the journal Political Theory in 2016 and was a great inspiration to me um, as I was embarking on my research on my most recent book. Um, Adam is staying with the theme of self-determination for her talk today. The title of her lecture is Africa for the Africans, a history of self-determination before decolonization. So thank you very much and I hope you all enjoy the lecture. Over to you, Adam. Great. Thanks very much, Sudhir. Um, thank you for that wa warm welcome and for the invitation um, that you and Dan Butt ex extended to me. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's a pleasure to share my work with you and especially under uh, this uh, occasion of the Omar Asfar lectures. Um, what I'll share today is part of a new uh, book project uh, tentatively titled the Universal Race, uh, Garveyism, and the Practices of Pan-Africanism. Um, and what I'll, what I'll be discussing is less specifically Garveyism itself, but some of the intellectual and political currents that gave rise uh, to the movement in the 1920s. So I look forward uh, to your questions and comments after, after the lecture. By 1923, uh, Marcus Garvey, the co-founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association with Amy Ashwood, claimed, which claimed by then a thousand local divisions across the Atlantic world and as far as Australia, as well as about six million members, had perfected an alluring origin story for his organization. In an essay published that year, he relays that the idea to name his organization the Universal Negro Improvement Association emerged as he sailed back from Jama uh, back to Jamaica from England. On the ship, he tells us, he encounters a fellow West Indian passenger who is sailing home with his wife from Basutuland. His West Indian interlocutor describes the horrors of native life in Africa which persuades Garvey to found a universal organization that would embrace the purpose of all Black humanity. 
By locating the founding of the UNIA in the Atlantic, Garvey makes implicit reference to the Black Star Line, the Garveyite ship of state, which promised to put the means of commerce and mobility in the hands of Black subjects. The deterritorial space of the seas also makes possible the meeting of Africa and the African diaspora. Uh, it enables the scattered race to be gathered in service of their collective liberation. But if the sea flattens the barriers between Africa and the diaspora, it does so unevenly. Africa, as represented by the Basutu wife of a West Indian, is present but silent. She is the object of their discussions and of their political aims, but cannot intercede on her own behalf. As with all origin stories, the ship scene was a myth. Garvey's interest in Africa emerged earlier while living in London between 1912 and 1914. At the dockyards where he first worked, he encountered a motley crew of African and Caribbean seamen. Through these networks, he would meet the Egyptian impresario turned journalist and, and editor, Duze Muhammad Ali. Just months before their meeting in 1912, Ali had launched the African Times and Orient Review as a monthly journal devoted to the interest of the colored races of the world. It especially dedicated itself to imp Britain's far-flung imperial subjects. It would be in the milieu of the African times that Garvey first came to understand the experiences of British West Indian subjects within, within a global frame. The journal's commitments to the, or to the rights of British imperial subjects would be echoed in his early conception of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Moreover, the UNIA's weekly paper, The Negro World, founded in 1918, mimicked the editorial style of the African Times, gathering regular coverage of the African world, picking up news from the darker nations more broadly, and including literary texts, especially poetry, alongside its journalistic and opinion pieces. While in London, Garvey would also immerse himself in the writings of earlier Pan-Africanists, especially the work of Edward Wilmot Blyden. Garvey requested reading privileges in October 1913 at the British Museum to access the works of the late Dr. Dr. Edward Blyden and other works that are not obtainable in any of the libraries of London. Through the literary and political world surrounding African times, he would also come to know the work of his contemporaries, especially that of J.E. Casely Hayford, the Gold Coast barrister and later founder of the National Congress of British West Africa, whose part speculative fiction, part autobiography, part political treatise, Ethiopia Unbound, was published in 1911. Though Garvey's ship story concealed this wider world of intellectual exchange and political coordination, it spoke to a reoccurring question of Pan-Africanism. On what grounds, or perhaps what waterways, might the need for solidarity and collaboration between African descended people in the Americas and Africa in the African continents be staged? As the anthropologist St. Clair Drake put it in the mid 20th century, Pan-Africanism involved the elaboration of an African interest. There was nothing natural or obvious about this interest. In describing the practices by which such an interest emerged, Brent Hayes Edwards turns to the language of articulation. Articulation involved a process of linking and connecting across gaps. It was a strategy of co conjoining and coordination that retains the residue of difference and that remains impermanent. In my remarks today, I'd like to examine two moments in the articulation of a pan-African interest uh, or an African interest under the sign of the motto, Africa for the Africans. This phrase marks an, makes an early appearance in the 1860s, uh, but it would be most closely associated with Garveyism in the 1920s. My aim in examining these moments is threefold. First, I seek to trace a transformation of diasporic conceptions of Africa, which begin in the 19th century as, as aspirations for emigration and civilizational uplift. In this early moment, Africa is a site of the redemptive agency of the diaspora that elevates African Americans to world historical actors. In the first two decades of the 20th century, however, 
Africa and Africans came to be viewed as coeval with the diaspora, as sharing the same collective fate of racial domination. Key to this transformation was an altered imperial context after the scramble for Africa and the transatlantic circulation of dialogue of languages of anti-racist critique. The imagination of Africa as contemporaneous also coincided with its deterritorialization. No longer a vision of a restored homeland and stretched transnationally, the new formulation was Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. My second objective is to suggest that under the rubric of Africa for the Africans, Pan-Africanists advanced the conception of self-determination as a form of soul craft an inward individual and collective project of reevaluating and revaluing blackness or Africanness. It would be characterized by transforming blackness from a wounded attachment to use Wendy Brown's fate phrase into a sign of political empowerment. Here we arrive at another way to read the before in the title, in the subtitle of today's talk, Self-Determination Before Decolonization. Before does not only mark the time prior to the mid-century nationalist movements that brought about African independence, and it, instead it also refers to the internally directed trans labor of self-transformation and self-emancipation perceived by many to have been a necessary first step in the struggle with white supremacy and imperialism. Third and finally, this is an effort to think through the distinctive nature of Pan-Africanism and especially its staying power. Well after the projects of Pan-Africanism associated with decolonization failed to materialize, Pan-African ideas and practices continue to circulate in diasporic religious and cultural practices, as well as popular movements and cultures. This persistence distinguishes Pan-Africanism from other Pan-movements which emerged almost simultaneously in the late 19th and early 20th century. I won't be taking up Pan-Africanism's legacies here, but in highlighting the role of the African diaspora and tracing the ways Africa appears as an idea and stage for the imaginations of emancipation, I aim to lay a foundation for such an investigation. Let me begin then with an early iteration of diasporic imaginations of Africa. An early exponent and popularizer of the phrase Africa for the Africans was the Pan-Africanist Edward Blyden, who Garvey was reading in the British Museum. Born in 1832 in the Danish colony of St. Thomas to free black parents, Blyden emigrated to Liberia in 1850 after having been denied admissions to Rutgers Theological College on the grounds of his race. There he edited a series of journals, taught Greek and Latin at Liberia College, and represented Liberia as ambassador to Britain and France. In 1861, he was also elected commissioner to the descendants of Africa in the United States and the West Indies, and worked in this role to encourage Black emigration to Liberia. Until his death in 1912, but especially between the 1860s and 1880s, Blyden advanced a view of Africa for the Africans understood through what he called repatriation and redemption. This view stemmed from a dual reading of slavery and its legacies. On the one hand, slavery was a de-civilizing, leveling, and distorting institution. The slave trade, he argued, violently disrupted indigenous societies and developmental trajectories. The African societies depicted in European travel narratives of the late 19th century were as a result ones that bore the marks of a persistent extraneous violence. The very term African, Blyden argued, was the product of slavery's disregard for differentiation within African societies. As a leveling institution, it made no discrimination between the Fula and the Mandingo, the Mendi, the Shanti, the Fanti, the Igbo, and the Congo between the descendants of nobles and the offspring of slaves, between kings and their subjects. In this process, it transformed the signs of black skin and woolly hair into a badge of inferiority, whose consequences were most pronounced in the Americas, where the descendants of enslaved people are overshadowed by a foreign and powerful people. Slavery in this 
account had parallel consequences for the diaspora and African societies, insofar as it violently disrupted and distorted social and political uh, development. In, in emigration, Blyden found a means of dis, de, removing diasporic Blacks from the yoke of foreign domination and making them the agents of political and social transformation in Africa. Paradoxically and disturbingly, Blyden comes to this conclusion by recoding the meaning of slavery as a providential interposition that prepared Black Americans for the task of civilizing Africa. Blyden describes the working of, of um, God's providential design as fourfold. First, by suffering, to them, suffering them to be brought here and placing in circumstances where they could receive training, fitting them for the work of civilizing and evangelizing the land whence they were torn, and by preserving them under the severest trials and afflictions. Secondly, by allowing them, notwithstanding all the services they have rendered to this country, to be treated as strangers and aliens, so as to cause them to have anguish of spirit, as was the case with the Jews in Egypt, and to make them long for some refuge for their social, from their social and civil deprivations. Third, by bearing a portion of them across the tempestuous seas back to Africa, by preserving them through the process of acclimation and by establishing them in the land, despite the attempts of misguided men to drive them away. Fourth, by keeping their fatherland in reserve for them in their absence. This argument in favor of uh, emigration marks a pivot in 19th century debates, uh, African-American debates. Before the Civil War, uh, African-Americans such as Mariah Stewart, Frederick Douglass and David Walker had rejected the colonization of, of free black and manumitted slaves to Liberia, viewing it as a racist venture designed to reinforce slavery. When in the antebellum period, Martin Delaney, James T. Hawley, and Marianne Shedd advocated emigration, uh, their territorial sites were not directed toward Africa, and they insisted on developing independent black organizations for emigration. When Blyden made his pitch for emigration in 1862, the Civil War and the prospects of emancipation dampened emigrationist aspirations. As the 1877 compromise brought Reconstruction's promise of social equal citizenship to a close, however, Liberia, um, Liberia fever spread across the South. Unlike the period dominated by the American Colonization Society, much of this energy now stemmed from popular and local self-organized societies among African-Americans called Exodus Associations, which pulled resources and information for a transatlantic journey. In its singular preoccupation with Africa and particularly Liberia, as well as its messianism, which echoed Pro uh, Blyden's providential vision, the late 19th century emigrationist politics Sharp, departed sharply from the earlier iterations. A capacious and flexible but pervasive language of racial destiny was at the center of this transformation. At a basic level, Michelle Mitchell argues, racial destiny implied that Black people shared a common fate, which enabled activists to pre pre prepare or propose a number of strategies, political, social, and cultural, moral and religious to ensure the collective's basic human rights, progress, prosperity, health, and reproduction. More specifically, the vision of racial destiny at the center of immigrationist politics sought to heal the violent wounds of slavery and Jim Crow with the balm of a predestined role in the world. As Brandy Hughes puts it in her work on missionary efforts of African Americans, to speak of the American Negro's preparation for missions abroad was to identify the history of Black experiences in America as a crucible of Christian civilization. Through this lens, the fractious histories of chattel slavery, abolitionism, civil war, and radical reconstruction was revisioned as predestined and even mutual events in the election of African Americans for the redemption of the belated race. For Blyden, the story of a people recently unshackled from slavery playing such a world historical role on the global stage was the great romance of the 19th century. 
slavery had made the African diaspora a people of a redemptive nationalist culture rather than a feeble race to be assimilated or dispossessed. This global epic of racial redemption would, in Blyden's words, rekindle the imagination, touch the heart and awaken the sympathies of all in whom there is a spark of humanity. In this story of redemption, notice that Africa itself is temporally bracketed and displaced to the past and future. Relegated to the past, Africa stands as a lost homeland and as a scene of arrested development. Striking in uh, Blyden's descriptions of African history is his refusal to center ancient empires and civilizations, um, uh, which would become important reference points for Black nationalism and Afrocentrism in, this, in the 20th century. As he put it, I do not like to refer to the historical fact of e Egypt and Ethiopia to strengthen the claims of the Negro upon the rest of hu humankind. In this image, um, in his image then, it's African-Americans spiritualized and aestheticized labor uh, that in the present uh, that would have redeemed the belated race. Um, and in this image, uh, Africans living on the continent are either abs absent or also transformed into objects to be worked on. Blyden remarks in surprise that Africa has been so far escaped colonization. It's rifled of its population and in some cases wholly unoccupied, he writes. This too, uh, Blyden reads as an act of providential interposition in that the land, though entirely unprotected, awaited the owners of the soil. He recognized uh, that emigration is a species of colonization, but moved quickly to distinguish the project of African-American settlement in Liberia from European colonization in the Americas and Oceania. The latter, driven by territorial aggrandizement, brought together violent alien races in violent encounter. In the case of Liberia, by contrast, he argues, the Aborigines are not a race alien from the colonists. And while there may be caste differences initially, this process of colonization was bound for amalgamation rather than hierarchical segregation over time. In order for this transformation to occur, however, the civilizing labor of African Americans must also be directed at the indigenous inhabitants. As Blyden put it, we have to work upon the people as well as upon the land, upon mind as well as upon matter. Africa was in this regard, a space of utopian anticipation that would ultimately secure the equality and freedom of Africans. But between this past and future, the past homeland and the future uh, moment of racial redemption stands the agency of the diaspora who are uniquely endowed to undo the po political stagnation wrought by slavery. In later works, including Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race from 1887, and African Life and Customs from 1908, Blyden would rethink his perspective. While he still advocated emigration, he insisted in this period that African indigenous institutions and practices, including Islamic rights, provided internal sources of civilizational development. From this perspective, Blyden increasingly articulated an identification with the African native, no longer absented or transformed into the objects of African American labor. Africans were part of a collective we. How did this happen and what were its consequences? To answer this question, we have to step away from Blyden himself to cons consider the transformed context of the late 19th and early 20th century. By the turn of the century, Blyden's suggestion that the diaspora's fatherland awaited in reserve for them in their absence was hard to sustain as the scramble for Africa uh, expanded Europe's hold on the continent. The late 19th century Liberian fever that had captured the imaginations of African Americans and to a lesser extent West Indians had also waned by the end of the 20th century's first decade. The new imperialism challenged the temporal displacement of Africa on which a vision of, of diasporic redemption rested. Neither the site of arrested development nor an assured space of world historical racial destiny, Africa was now co-present 
interpolated in a global scene of imperial and racial hierarchy. It was not, however, the mere fact of this transformed geopolitical context that produced new forms of identification. Instead, the emerging print cultures of British West Africa inserted the region into transatlantic conversations about race and modernity. Key to this landscape was of newspapers was the early Sierra Leone Weekly News, founded in 1884 with the support of Blyden, the Lagos Weekly uh, Record, founded in the 1890s, the Gold Coast uh, Leader, which began publication in 1902, and the Gold Coast Nation, founded 1912. These periodicals were not anti-imperial in ways that we would associate with ma later nationalist formations, but they took up more centrally critiques of the new, new imperialism. And here I'll just draw on the two Gold Coast papers. As the first issue of the Gold Coast Leader in June 1902 explained, our people are sinking deeper and deeper day by day into the iron grip of economic slavery. Despite our vaunted 20th century improvements and advantages, towns are being de depopulated, commerce getting worse and worse, whether we, whatever we possessed dignified with the name of rights are slipping fast off of our hands. Day by day, we are being trampled upon. The Negro, who is he? His rights. The trampling of rights reappears throughout this period. As the following issue argues, never before had the native had cause of misgivings as to the safety of his liberty, his rights and privileges as today. The hereditary immemorial rights of our kings and chiefs our public and even private men are today not merely questioned or impugned, but contemptuously ignored or arbitrarily trampled upon. Across the pages of the leader in its first decade of publication, uh, the neologism negrophobism is employed to describe this new form of racial hierarchy. The phrase self-consciously picks up on the uh, accusation of negrophilism which originated in the United States during the 19th century to name and often ridicule those who supported abolition and broadly advocated for the extension of civil and political rights to black people. With this invented term, the leader inserts British West Africa into a wider Anglophone world of debate about race and racial hierarchy. Negrophobism marked explicit structural barriers, such as the exclusion of native doctors from a new pay scheme, but it was also evidence in everyday encounters, such as when a colored gentleman aboard a ship did not remove his hat while in proximity to a European passenger, igniting a violent dispute. It is worth noting two things about these reports of negrophobism. First, Shipped, ships uh, frequently emerged as sites of these racialized interactions. Given the ways in which ships functioned as a sign of both mobility and modernity, the racialized delimitation, delimitations of passage by sea were particularly evocative of the hierarchy and exclusion that marked the new imperialism. This commentary also anticipates what would become a central concern during the interwar period the restrictions on the freedom of movement for the colored subjects of the British Empire. Second, Negrophobism in the British Empire is frequently juxtaposed to Jim Crow America. Initially, these comparisons are meant to shame the empire by insisting that it should not reproduce this American problem. Interracial prejudices at this stage of the 20th century seem greatly out of place. Um, notes one issue of the leader. Things are bad enough in America where there's no admission for Negroes at hotels, restaurants, and boarding houses. But we are living in an English colony, and fortunately for us, in all the places of our individual and social lives as Negroes, there is a security or a protection enjoyed which is known, which is known by our ill-starred in the, in the certain parts of the United States. Which, um, okay. In this formulation, the rights of Negroes, however precarious in the colony, are thought to be more secure than they are across the Atlantic. By the second decade of the 20th century, however, um, this differentiation no longer stands. 
West African writers imported the category of Jim Crow to describe the problem of racial hierarchy in the colonies. This coincided with uh, the reprinting of speeches and essays by African American writers, the inclusion of reports uh, from the NAACP and other materials that begin to appear uh, regularly in um, the pages of the Gold Coast Leader, Gold Coast Nation, and Sierra Leone Weekly News. There was no longer um, uh, in these comparisons and in the turn uh, to Jim Crow, there was no longer a distinction between the English colonies and the United States to be made. Uh, one testament to this uh, growing comparison and mobilization of the category of Jim Crow is the emergence um, in the 1916, several 1916 issues of the Gold Coast Nation a writer uh, who uses the pseudonym Jim Crow, um, writing between kind of March 1916 and October 1916, uh, the figure Jim Crow uh, appears in a series of open letters to critique the denationalization of the Gold Coast as the country became, uh, quote, the hunting ground by these children of the barren North. So when Marcus Garvey arrived in London in 1912, he would find uh, this shared language of critique in the pages of the African Times and Orient uh, Review. In its first issue, African Times declared, the, universal racist, the recent Universal Racist Congress convened in the metropolis of the Anglo-Saxon world clearly demonstrated that there was ample need for a pan-Oriental, pan-African journal at the seat of the British Empire which would lay the aims, desires, and intentions of the black, brown, and yellow races of the at the throne of Caesar. With reference to the Anglo-Saxon world, African Times named a global color line, organized and by and spanning the United States and the British Empire. According to the um, a regular contributor, J.C. Smith, writing in 1913, Within the worldwide realm of Anglo-Saxondom, at Suez and at Panama, throughout the solid south of the United States, and throughout British Africa, from Cape to Cairo, from Verde to Garadufi, there is growing up the morti there is growing up the mortifying feeling that the principles of human liberation are being insidiously superseded by the policy of human enslavement and degradation of all non-European peoples. A crucial strategy of African times, which would be replicated by other periodicals, was the republication of articles from local newspapers, like those from British West Africa. Tightly packed at about 50 pages for, per issue, the experience of reading African times was one in which this thesis of an Anglo-Saxon world's racial domination would be evidenced through site-specific examples that spanned from Puerto Rico to Ghana, from Cairo to the Cape, from Hawaii to Malaysia. In these Black Atlantic forums of empire, whether in coastal cities or the journals and periodicals of the day, writers and readers came to undo the temporal bracketing of Africa that had characterized Blyden's providential vision. There was in this process an experience of simultaneity. A contemporaneous Africa was now the site of parallel and shared struggle. Restored to the present, Africa was also spatially stretched. The spatial extension was at the heart of a new formulation of an old motto, Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. The conjoining of Africans at home and abroad, the simultaneity of Africa and diaspora, marked a second iteration of this Pan-African phrase. Let me turn now to this. As World War I came to a close, the, uh, the editor of African Times, Duze Ali, received a letter from, the, from Dillian Govin, who identified himself as the secretary treasurer of the Association of Universal Loyal Negroes. Sometimes named the National Association of Loyal Negroes in the archives, the organization appears to have been founded in Panama among the large community of British West Indian migrant workers who had worked on canal construction. It also had a connection uh, to British West Indians in Canada. Govan was writing uh, from, from Montreal uh, sh and shared with Ali the association's aim 
to have a large independent colony established in the place of German East Africa or German Southwest Africa. The fate of the German colonies in Africa, especially as a testing ground for new, the newly emerging principle of self-determination, was an important touchstone for a range of Pan-Africanists, including such opposed figures as Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois. The association of loyal Negroes echoed Blyden's language of a farther land, and there remains also a civilizational dimension to the conception of the independent colony. But the agents of this uplift are not limited to the diaspora, and emigration itself is never a central aspiration. Drawing on Lloyd George's December 1917 statement that primary regard will be given to the wishes and sentiments of the natives, the association calls for plebiscites in the British, in the German colonies to establish independent native states under international guarantees. In the association's petition to Arthur Balfour, they describe the basis of their claims in the following ways. Your petitioners feel it is incumbent upon them to make known to His Majesty's government their wish wishes and sentiments as Negroes, and therefore natives of Africa being of the com same common stock as the native born Africans. In advancing this theory, your petitioners have disregarded the territorial delimitations of the continent of Africa and tribal distinctions which might be prejudicial to their interests. And your petitioners urge that their definition of the term native be accepted on the principle that Africa is the aboriginal home of the Negro race and all persons of Negro blood are natives of Africa in the strictest application of the term. I want to point to two features of this petition. First, the claim of being natives of Africa sits alongside another articulation of political belonging. Your petitioners are British subjects by reason of birth and parentage, begins the first article of the petition. Indeed, it was loyalty to the British Empire, exemplified by wartime service, that was referenced in the name Association of Loyal Negroes. Claims to being African natives neither dissolved this imperial membership nor amounted to a program of rep repatriation. Second and more striking are the grounds on which this claim to being African natives is staged. The theory, as the association writes, is based on disregarding Africa's territorial delimitations. What it did mean to deterritorialize Africa in this manner? How did this disregard for territorial delimitations shape this new phase of Pan-Africanism? The association of loyal Negroes disbanded before elaborating its own theory. Many of its members, however, would join the newly reconstituted Universal Negro Improvement Association. While the UNIA was uh, first uh, founded as a self-help organization com committed to imperial citizenship, Garvey was now based in the United States um, and refounded the UNIA in 1918, embracing the mantle of the wider anti-colonial demand for self-determination and seeing his project in connection to efforts in Egypt, Ireland, and India. The, uh, the UNIA's motto, Africa for the Africans at home and abroad, and the special spatial stretching of Africa uh, pointed towards the articulation of a new Negro world. This was first and foremost a geopolitical category. It tethered together a scattered race by reference to a common political predicament what Garvey describes as a common grievance and a common complaint. The UNIA's paper, uh, The Negro World, sought to articulate this common fate by mapping a global landscape of both racial domination and the intimations of a coming revolution. This was a scalar imagination that encoded the local through the global. In this process, it mapped a black world in and against other worlds. To speak of a Black world in geopolitical terms was always a comparative project. It only made sense in relation to other world, worlds, whether that of the Anglo-Saxon world or parallel building, world building efforts of uh, similarly situated pan movements. The conjoining of home and abroad marked out a global stage for the project of racial liberation. We are building a universal rather than a national movement, Garvey declared in 1921. 
a transformation of self-perception through an understanding of the universality of the Negro question were central to the UNIA's vision. Linked up through the UNIA and the Negro world, Garveyites were induced to see themselves in this universal frame by investing local political and economic struggles with a far-reaching glo uh, global significance. At, this, at times, this took the form of a scalar leap. Garveyism has caused me to see myself on a large scale, wrote a UNIA member from Miami. At, at others, it took the form of remapping the world structures of political and economic power. Writing from Lagos, Nigeria, another Garveyite celebrated how the program of the Blacks, especially in America and West Africa, astonishes the people and causes those in Europe and others in other countries everywhere to fear. Here, the parallel and intersecting political projects of the Blacks is a sign of a world on the precipice of radical rupture. The presidents of, of the Ludert's uh, division of the UNIA in Southwest Africa, now Namibia, would draw on this image of a Black world in motion to, to, to um, enlist new membership in the organization. Fall into line with the UNIA and do something for the, yourself, he declared. Our brothers across the sea are waiting on you. Now is your time to make a bid for freedom and liberty before it is too late. A black world on the, on the move on both sides of the Atlantic suggested that the tables were about to turn, that the last shall be first. Remapping the global color line in this manner, Garveyites understood themselves as world historical actors whose time was now. This, was one, this is one way to understand the universal Negro of the UNIA, which named the emergence of a new political agent. Like its counterpart and sometimes synonym, the new Negro, the universal Negro was a figure with a newly discovered political consciousness, radicalized and awakened in large part owing to a greater internationalism. The universal Negro was politically empowered, capable of remaking the self and the world. A deterritorialized Africa, an Africa at home and abroad, became the scene not of future anticipation, but of present political possibility. If for Blyden and, and late uh, 19th century emigrationists, Africa for the Africans was the sign under which the trauma of slavery would be recast as the foundation of a redemptive agency, and now marked the transformation of the Negro associated with domination and de denigration, as a figure endowed with a new political power. The transformation of self-regard, the reorientation of the self in a wider, in relation to a wider world of imperial and racial hierarchy was perceived by many contributors uh, to, to the Negro world. Allow me space in the most valuable paper of the day to say a few words uh, to my fellow black men begins an open letter from Chief Takji uh, from the Gold Coast in the June, January 14th, 1922 issue of the Negro World. The chief relays how he had heard about the weekly newspaper from one H.B. Hall of Oklahoma. The correspondence with Mr. Hall, access to the Negro World, and the very letter through which he addresses his fellow black men is made possible by the reading and translation of his um, clerk. Um, through, this, through this mediation, he hears of the grand meetings of the UNIA in, in New York. Uh, I wish I were there, he writes, but where physical presence is impossible, the Negro world serves as a crucial link. For Chief Takji, more significant than the project of future emancipation was what the movement had already achieved. The practices of articulating a Black world, of making possible the linkages through which his letter could appear in a publication based in New York, were already a triumph. As he put it, many people speak of a victory to come, but for me, I say it is already there. So I will stop there and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much indeed, Adam, for that, uh, that wonderful, that incredibly rich talk. Uh, we're very grateful indeed. So um, we now have time for um, some questions and, and answers indeed. So uh, as you can see, if you just type your question into the uh, Q&A box, 
then um, I will be able to put them on your behalf to Adam. So the first question comes from uh, Kevin Irakozi. Um, could you speak more about the reasons for Blyden's disregard for African civilizations in his earlier formulation of the project? What did those civilizations lack, which he found in Black Diaporic Agency? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think um, I think there's one powerful or important uh, way to read his kind of resistance um, on uh, locating kind of on thinking about redemption through the past, right? Um, which I think is is just the sense of this becomes a problem, of course, for um, Afrocentrism uh, more generally is. Um, you know, a, a whole set of debates about in what sense, you know, Egypt is an African civilization, etc. It's a way of kind of, you know, bracketing the question of the past and thinking about uh, present possibility and, the, and a certain kind of work on the self and a collective work in the present that might generate transformation. So I think that's, you know, kind of generous reading about that bracketing of the past. But I think for, for Blyden, as was the case for other figures with whom he's in conversation in this period, other emigrationists, uh, you know, there's two reasons why, why he thinks um, diasporic Blacks uh, have, have a particular, particular form of world historical agency. And it has to do first and foremost with um, a, an experience of having been Christianized, um, having, having become Christian, and having some connection to a modern world vis-a-vis -vis their presence in the United States. Um, so it's this kind of, uh, you know, edu education, you know, pedagogical project that they had undergone in the West, in the, in the Americas, that facilitates their ability to um, generate transformation on, on the continent. Um, you know, I think what happens for Blyden is that in his time in Liberia and in, in, and in Sierra Leone, where he also spends time, he becomes especially connected um, to Islamic scholars and clerics. Uh, so this so this initiates this encounter initiates a kind of transformation of how he evaluates, um, a, you know, African civilization. I mean, it's also the first time he really being on the continent and having to engage with this set of figures becomes the first time he has to really think about um, practices, institutional formations, et cetera, that persist on the continent. Um, so in many ways, I think in the 1860s, he's really preoccupied um, with the legacy of slavery in the, in the Americas and a way of trying trying to recode what that legacy might mean for diasporic um, Africans as part of a kind of world historical project of, of racial redemption. Thank you. Just, just on Blyden, could you say a bit more about um, his, if you like, his theological origins? Um, and obviously I know that he's a, I know he's a Zionist and obviously the uh, the, the parallel with the, with the Jews in Egypt is, is very strong and this idea of, a, you know, a, uh, slavery as a providential intervention is kind of an extraordinary idea. I mean, to what extent is that just seen as a parallel or is there something, is there something more going on there, do you think? It's a great question. I mean, he also writes a book called uh, West Africa to Palestine. Um, so he is very interested in um, the question of, uh, and I think this is true of African-American writers uh, throughout this period, the Exodus story is a central kind of uh, way of imagining um, African African American emancipation, uh, but he has both a, a long-standing interest in a Jewish diaspora. There's Jewish presence in the Danish West Indies, um, which he writes about more in a more autobiographical vein. So ever so, he has this kind of interest in a parallelism, um, but I don't think it's actually very unique to him. It's a it's a story that um, it's a kind of um, you know, account that others share. I think another exemplary, exemplary figure in this way of thinking is Alexandra Crummel, uh, who also spends time in Liberia in this, in this period. Um, they overlap there and they share a similar kind of conception of, of slavery as this kind of providential intervention that generates, that actually generated um, newfound political capacities. Um, 
Uh, so there's a kind of overlap overlap there. Um, you know, I'm not sure actually which church he belonged to, but the primary, um, you know, in, institutional vector for this missionary work would be the African Methodist Episcopalian Church. Um, so many of the emigrationists would be, um, were associated with the AME. And in 1895, there's a, a Congress on Africa that's organized by Gammon Theological Seminary in, in Atlanta, and a variety of these figures, including Crummel, is present. Uh, Blyden is invited, but can't attend and sends a letter of gre greeting. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there's a question now from Jeremy Burkhardt. Hello, Jeremy. Um, he says, thanks for a great paper. Um, could you say something about how the strands of Pan-Africanism you've been speaking about relate to or conflict with other claims to universal political identities in this period, such as Marxist workers of the world uh, claims and so forth? That's a, it's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, in some ways, so the title, um, the title of the book I mentioned, The Universal Race, is in some ways thinking about, of course, uh, in trying to think about the idea of a universal race in relation to something like a universal class. Um, and I think this is, um, you know, it's, it's a complicated issue. I, I mean, I think one thing to say about the period of Garveyism is that Garvey himself is quite opposed uh, to um, you know, socialist or communist um, uh, in, uh, efforts at or thinking through the race question as part and parcel of a class question, um, a wider class question. But at the local levels, uh, the UNIAs often um, interacts with and directly is, you know, supporting working class um, mobilization. So there's a series of strikes, for instance, early like in 1919 in, um, in, um, in Trinidad, in which the UNIA plays a, a you know, a central, a central role in, or in the organization and leadership of that strike. But I think one thing I'm interested in, in doing with the wider project is thinking about how some of the practices by which, you know, uh, individuals and collectives come to understand themselves as world historical actors actually may have parallels with uh, organizations for which class and workers are the primary subject, that both of these in, are, are kind of, of course, inventions, right? Um, they're, they're constructions. And what I'm interested in is kind of how those, how people, what are the kind of everyday practices, uh, what are, and, um, and institutional formations um, ex through which people come to identify themselves in these kind of universal terms. And, um, and also, um, yeah, and I think there are like more parallels between something like Pan-Africanism and, and, you know, a kind of Marxist class politics than is usually assumed on this question. So it's, it's also to open up this question of um, uh, Pan-Africanism or to the kinds of questions we would ask about, like, uh, about class, right, that, that there's some process of I identification of of resign of resignification of of a of a kind of practice of transforming one's perspective orientation and politics over the course of time and I think that's something that if you know people who study the for formations of class politics and who think about class less as a kind of pre-existing category but also a category that has to ma be made are attentive to and I want to bring some of that into this work. Very good. Okay, um, there's a question from uh, Hazim Hardiman. He sa uh, they say, uh, you mentioned briefly that instead of what grounds, we might ask what uh, ocean ways made these projects possible. Could you say more about the importance of shifting our focus away from terra-centric analytical frames to focus on the maritime in this story? Yes, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, in some ways, of course, um, that's, that was a homage to uh, Paul Gilroy's important work on the Black Atlantic and the ways in which he wants to think about uh, the ocean space, the Atlantic as a kind of, um, you know, of course, as the site of, uh, of 
kind of the violence of the Middle Passage, but also the ways in which it makes possible these sets of circulations, um, translations, uh, and exchanges. Um, so one thing, I mean, I, I've been interested in this also with my first book is, I think, um, to kind of reinsert Africa back into that story of, of, the, of, the, of the Atlantic processes of exchange. Um, so even for Gilroy, I think there, there's a way in which the kind of modernity of the Black Atlantic is really a diasporic project, right? And the ocean is a way of actually leaving aside Africa as a kind of lost homeland or a place we, a, 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 a site from which we, we initiate a set of journeys, um, but not one that's kind of forever refracted into these conversations about what the Atlantic world is. So I think I'm of two minds about this in some ways. Um, so on the one hand, I'm interested in this kind of reinsertion of Africa into the space of the Black Atlantic. At the same time, I think we have to be clear that the kind of um, privileging of the oceanic, of the of if the seas is also to uh, leave out certain kinds of characters, right? Those who might not be mobile, those who um, uh, who who don't who don't live on the coast, right? Uh, so so it's also then to think about something like what 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 does the paper, the Negro world, make possible, right? I mean, surely it travels by sea. Seamen, black seamen are an important way that it gets to the Gold Coast and other places. So it still travels on the waterways, right? But it also, you know, it's another kind of um, non-land based deter. It's a deterritorial de form itself, right? And so it's also to think about how that deterritorialization could happen in different spaces beyond, you know, beyond the oceans. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Ben Horton, which is about political systems. So political systems vis-a-vis -vis the, the Pan-African future. So it says, he guesses back in the late 19th century, imperialism was seen by Europeans, at least, as a viable way of organising states and populations. Was the world making conducted by African thinkers in this period fundamentally democratic? Or would an African empire or other authoritarian modes of government have been seen as a legitimate goal? It's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, what I would say about uh, this period that I'm working on and, and what's challenging and exciting about it is that, it, you know, this they largely Garveyites and the kind of forms of critique I was identifying in these early newspapers in British West Africa do not pre do not are not really imagining a world after empire. Um, they think that empires are going to be empires, both the kind of horizon, the the condition of possibility under which these sets of connections are being forged. And they think about it as a kind of future horizon in in very in different kinds of ways. Like one, um, as Ben was suggesting, was this imagination of a kind of black empire, Negro empire that stands counterposed to European empires. So a vision of equality or parity in which an imper a black imperial form would stand against, uh, stand alongside um, these other imperial formations. Um, the second way that empire remains a kind of persistent, you know, a site of, uh, of, of anticipation or desire, political desire, is as kind of demands for the rights of British imperial subjects, right? Uh, so to in continue to insist on, um, on um, you know, equality within the British Empire. Uh, so I think what that suggests is, I mean, I don't think that these are necessarily, they're not democratic projects. I don't think empires uh, are necessary, are, are, are at all. And this, this isn't a kind of a democratic project, but I think it's an opportunity to think with, for us, you know, about what were the investments in empire? Like, what did people think you know, who were imperial subjects, uh, why were they attached to the idea of empire? What did they think it made possible for them? And I think one thing, you know, that continues to bring people back to, or brought people back to the idea of empire in this period is that it, it promised a certain kind of non-territorial 
and you know possibly universal form of inclusion um i mean in its ideal form you know that was what the british empire was supposed to be and in in and and the kind of visions of a black empire a negro empire are trying to kind of recreate the lost promise of that idea Thank you. Well, that, that leads on to this question from Edward Milford, which is about language. He says, um, do all these, th th this thought about universality, so do all these strands presuppose a universally understood language, presumably English? Is there any discussion of or in other languages? Yeah, great, uh, great question. I mean, one, I think, you know, um, I presented a piece of this at the African Studies Association in a panel about global intellectual history, more generally, Africa and global intellectual history. And I think one question for those of us who are interested in, in these um, kind of circuits of translation and the adoption of or the movement of ideas across space and time, you know, one thing I think we have to wrestle with is that was that does that always privilege a certain set of actors who have facility, if not in English, then certainly some European languages. And what it would it mean to to kind of do another kind of work that also traces the ways in which these ideas get taken up in kind of um, non-European languages. And I think one person who's done a lot of great work on this from a different, you know, different part of the continent is Emma Hunter, who's thinking about vernacular presses and the ways in which vernacular presses uh, mobilize these same categories and re-signify what, what they might mean. I, for, the, for the purposes of the work I am doing, I mean, I think, you know, I think the Brit, um, the Garveyism's primary base is in kind of the Anglophone world, but it did have it. So it's after the United States, the second largest number of divisions, local divisions were actually in Cuba. And that was partly because of large British West Indian presence in, in, in plantation labor in Cuba. But, but it also prompted the, the Negro world to initiate a a French, um, or sorry, a Spanish um, part of the paper. So they have a kind of Spanish um, component to the paper and an attempt again to speak to the kind of uh, the, the Cuban and other contexts where Spanish was the primary medium. The other thing you find is a lot of translation work. Um, so uh, the, the Garvey papers, for instance, includes a variety of um, Portuguese sources, um, Again, which are which are engaged in this project of and, and French sources, um, Senegal and Dahomey, um, become really crucial Garveyite sites too. Uh, so you see some kind of processes of or practices of translation through which um, you know uh, either pieces of the Gar uh, of the UNIA are being replicated into um, local periodicals and in, in into French and Portuguese. Thank you. Um, a question from Stephen West. He says, um, "Could you?" It's a question about Blyden. Could you expand on how Blyden influenced the African independence movement, particularly his effect on uh, George Padmore and Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana? Um, yeah. So thanks. Thanks for that. I mean, this last book I mentioned of of Blyden's um, African time. Um, Afri on African life and native customs. Uh, I think this is a really important an important book and it's important to think about it, I think, as part of a wider set, set of um, texts that come out in this period in West Africa that are trying to reconstruct what, what the customary or the native is. And I think it's also important to situate that in the wider transformation of imperial discourse towards indirect rule. So, something like um, J.E. Casey Hayford's Gold Coast Native Institutions comes out in this time. Before that, John Mensa Sarba's uh, Fonti Customary Laws. So there's this wider turn at the late 19th and early 20th century to begin to think about what are kind of indig indigenous um, customary law, indig indigenous practices and institutions. Um, so I think one of the things that comes out of Blyden's book that becomes very important for later nationalists is the idea of a kind of African socialism. I mean, he very much, you know, 
centers in on, in that book on kind of customary or co collective forms of land ownership uh, and says this is a kind of proto-socialism uh, that contemporary European socialists might learn from uh, in a variety of ways. So he puts African native customs in dialogue with contemporary socialist formations. And of course, this idea of, of, of a kind of indigenous socialism would become really important, less to Padmore, but Nkrumah and others. Another place that, that these kind of late writings have a kind of resonance for later 20th century, later mid-century nationalists, is the idea of, um, you know, a, a, a kind of African personality. Um, I can't I can't say for sure, but I think Blyden is the first person to really use that term. Um, and we might relate that to this question from George Keyes. He says the, the diasporic concept and conversation seems one sided, moving in one direction from the Americas. Where are the African voices and how did they view diaspora? Um, okay, I, I thought in some ways that my talk was trying to address this question by turning to the, um, you know, uh, so yes, I spent a lot of time on Blyden, but, but the second part of the talk where I was focusing on the, um, uh, the periodicals from West Africa is my attempt to try and correct this, you know, picture. And in some ways, um, I started with the kind of image of, of Garvey's, Gar, the story Garvey himself tells about the, the, the ship, right, where there's an African woman present who does not speak, right? And in some ways, by turning to this kind of periodical culture of the, um, of the West, of West Africa in, in the kind of early 20th century, it's an attempt to sort of show the ways in which actually the idea of Africa emerged not just from the diaspora, but but in and through a dialogue uh, with with kind of African writers and intellectuals, um, and and what they're able to do, I think, is to ins insert Africa into a conversation about race and modernity um, in the 20th century that then begins to shape something like these imperial counter publics like the, the the world around African times and Orient Review. Um, so precisely I'm interested in this kind of correction. I think one thing to notice about that is that largely this kind of public conversation is really a kind of um, it, it, it does it, it does become a transatlantic dialogue, but one still in which men are the actors, right? So so whereas that story, a kind of um, the Garvey story is two West Indian men talking about Africa represented as a woman, what we get by the end of this, uh, the kind of narrative I've told is still a kind of fraternal dialogue. Um, you notice the kind of language um, that Chief Sakji uses at the end, my fellow, you know, fellow Negro men or fellow Black men. Um, so there are other, I mean, um, women are an import, important actors in the UNIA and they play some of leading roles in local divisions, but the story is one in which when, even when you kind of correct for the lopsided character, it still remains a kind of st story about men. Thank you. Um, question from Shuk Ying Chan. Hi, Ying. Um, thanks for the excellent talk. Could you say a bit more about thinking about Pan-Africanism through the concept of universal race rather than Black nationalism? Or do you think of the two as, as interchangeable? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I'm trying to get out of the category of Black nationalism by this through, through this project. Um, and for a couple of for a couple of reasons. I think the most, perhaps the most important one is that the story about Black nationalism is really an American story. Um, it's a story that that um, tracks onto a kind of traditional, you know, now increasingly, um, uh, you know, re rejected way of reading the tradition of African-American political thought allow along the lines of integrationism versus separatism, right? And so, and the Black nationalists in that story are kind of representative of a varieties of separatism. Um, what I find unproductive about that in some ways is, is that one, it, it, you know, suggests a kind of linear or a kind of 
that that something like black nationalism remains the same story or the, has the same set of preoccupations and questions over the long run. Um, it also doesn't capture, I think, what's really important about Garveyism, which is it comes out of a British imperial formation. I think the West Indies and, the, and West Africa are incredibly important to its intellectual origins. And in those places, the category of, of Black nationalism just doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, you know, there isn't a kind of internal, like that's not a language that these characters use. So that's one, um, you know, that's one reason I, I want to kind of move away from it. And I, as with my first project, I'm also interested in kind of thinking through, I think of the, the language of Black nationalism as a kind of there's a intimation that this is a kind of insular project, a closed off project. And one of the things I want to do is show how expansive and how really world spanning uh, Garveyism is. So that's the second reason to turn to this language. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Matthew Parker, who says, who asks, is it possible to generalize about attitudes in the early 1920s in West, in West Africa to the UNIA and the various strands of Garveyism, including the Black, Black Star Line, and also his ambitions for his own potential leadership role there? <laughs> Very short answer is no. I mean, this is the, you know, um, it's quite a challenge to do this project as I think as a political theorist because it's such a fragmented archive. Like, it's not like you can just say, it's not a project that's about the political thought of Marcus Garvey or, or the political thought of a set of figures. It's really trying to be a political theory of a maths movement. And so there's a kind of, it's, it's a methodological challenge, I think, as a political theorist to think about how I would do that you know, the ways historians have done that is by producing rich social histories that looks at kind of Garveyism in Cuba or Garveyism in South Africa, right? And to tell us the very specific ways in which, why this movement emerges at this in this particular site, what people are trying to do through the project. Um, so for me, the way that I, I mean, it may, it may be ultimately unsatisfactory, also, especially a lot of the Garve scholars of Garveyism, but, you know, the thing I'm trying to do is first try and kind of reconstruct this, this sort of intellectual origins um, uh, and intellectual currents that give rise to the movement. And then the second part of the book is going to look at very sp discrete political practices. Um, um, so the first will be kind of the annual convention, and it's kind of the ways that m form of the convention gets reiterated in some local chapters, uh, a chapter on leadership and the debates about leadership, including Garvey's leadership, a chapter on kind of the practices of or oratory and elocution, which become really important across the space, and then the, sec the last one on kind of rumor and conspiracy. So it's trying to take these discrete terms that I think of as part of the practices of the movement and try to track them across different space. Um, I'm sure it's very sensible uh, always to say no to a question about whether it's possible to generalize. That seems like a good a good tactic. Um, <laughs> that is the end of our time today. Um, I'm sorry we didn't quite get uh, through all the questions, although we got through most of them. I see there's a, a comment there as well about Du Bois from uh, Farid Asbar, Omar's brother. Good to hear from you, Farid. Good to thank you for coming. Um, and of course, I, what I haven't been reading out when reading out all these questions is all the bits saying how fantastic the talk was and how grateful everyone was for your a wonderful talk Adam and I absolutely want to join with that and thank you very much indeed for uh, that wonderful talk so thank you to everyone for coming thank you for all your questions thank you to Adam for speaking to us and I hope to uh, see you all again in person maybe actually here in Bailey or rather than virtually so on behalf of us all thank you very much indeed thanks very much for having me this was a pleasure